You're listening to the Results Driven Organizations podcast with Dr. Tanya Lowe, a podcast of curated conversations with C-suite leaders and those who support organizational growth and development. Get ready for inspiring interviews, educational lessons, and thought-provoking discussions that will challenge you to execute something new and innovative that will drive results in your organization. And now, here's Dr. Tanya Lowe. Hello. You're listening to the Results Driven Organizations podcast with Dr. Tanya Lowe, using my results driven philosophy of strategy, leadership, teams, and customer experiences. I help organizations develop their best kept secret, their human capital. Our guest today is John Ferguson. John Ferguson currently serves as the Chief Human Resources Officer for NASCAR the American auto racing sanctioning and operating company that is best known for stock car racing. This interview is going to be fast, fast, fast. NASCAR is the leading promoter of motorsports activities and sanctions more than 1,200 races in over 30 U.S. states, Canada, Mexico, and Europe. In John's role as Chief Human Resources Officer, he is responsible for the development and execution of NASCAR's human resource planning in support of the overall business plan and strategic direction of the organization. With headquarters in Daytona Beach, Florida, and offices throughout the United States, he helps to employ and evaluate career paths, oversee all HR functions, and implement special tactics to help meet NASCAR's targeted goals. John, welcome to RDO. Hey, hey, happy to be here today, Dr. Lowe. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to join. Ah, well, I'm so glad that we're able to, to do this. So, um, so let's jump right in. I think it's going to be a, an amazing conversation for our listeners. So my first question right off the bat, John, what attracted you to NASCAR? Was it their their values, their mission, their vision? What, you know, because you you have you're no stranger to leadership. Why NASCAR? Yes, great, great question. We actually just did a, a social campaign asking our employees why NASCAR. So uh, this is my story. Um I was not necessarily um watching NASCAR prior to joining. Okay. Of course, very familiar with the sport. But I was in stick and ball, so hockey and basketball uh, back in D.C. And so there was an opportunity that became available. uh, And at first I was like, I'm good. You know, I'm not trying to relocate like motorsports sounds fun, but maybe that's not for me. Uh, But after a few conversations, I quickly realized that there was a lot of opportunity here and there was a lot of excitement and momentum in the space. Mm -hmm. Uh, So full transparency, my first NASCAR race was a week before I started. So I'd already accepted the job and committed. And I said, well, I should probably go check out the race. And so that's (laughs) what I did, my older brother and I. And from then we were both just hooked. Uh, When you come and experience the 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 racing product in person, it is unparalleled to anything else, I believe, in sports. When you think about the close proximity, you can get to uh, the excitement. So I like to give this uh, this example. So you go, if you want to take a family of four to to a, a NBA game or NFL game, you want to sit courtside or field side, you're going to pay a price that's not attainable for the average family. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at NASCAR, I think we have that same type of close proximity and access, even to I would say you at NASCAR, you get to go to the locker room because you get to go. You can get access to the garage. You can get access to see the haulers, which is sort of their behind the scenes space. Now, that's an elevated ticket price, but it's not out of the reach of the average family. Uh, so if you wanted to make that a possibility for you and your family, it's one that you could. And so then when I think about the opportunity to work here, not only be a fan of the sport, but to work here, uh, it was just ripe for for impact, ripe for change. And so uh, in having those conversations, I was really dialed in and bought into the vision for where we are going. Uh, in 2023, we celebrated 75 years of NASCAR. And so now in the 76th season, I'm excited and I'm propelled by the energy that we've had from the, the, the previous 75. And I'm excited to see where we'll go for the next 75 and to be a part of that journey. Oh, wow. I love your story. I love that you, you took the chance to step into something new and different and be a part of, of history. And I think that is something that is very exciting and also 
when you think about stepping into something new, uncharted territory, it opens the door for other people to do the same thing. So I love your story. Thank you for sharing that with us. So John, you're like I said, you're no stranger to leadership. You've held several leadership roles in your career. What do you believe are some of the biggest leadership challenges that leaders face today? And just kind of, you know, in your own thoughts, where would you steer them to start addressing them? So I think the first part is what are, what are their challenges? Yes. <laughs> I think the, you know, there there are several challenges in the workplace today, but I think one that really stands out to me that would appeal to, uh, you know, your most broadest audience is the the varying generations in the workforce mix today. Um, so you may have baby boomers, you may have traditionalists, you may have uh, Gen X, millennials, Gen Y. Uh, so all of those are starting to either enter thrive or exit the workplace, but they all have different characteristics. So you want to make sure that uh, most importantly, that you're meeting people where they are. And I like to tell a story here because it was my two daughters that really helped me understand what that means. Now, of course, they are they are what I believe is being termed as Generation Alpha, also known as screenagers, because uh, they're like digital natives. Mm -hmm. uh, but in that process, my two daughters, I have to approach them totally different, you know, as individuals. Like it's not a one size shoe fits all. My oldest daughter, uh, she can she can take it pretty straightforward and, and, and keep moving. Yes, sir, daddy. My youngest daughter will say, you don't like me and you don't love me. If I just say, like, why did you not throw your plate away? She is like, you have just crushed me. Uh, but while their two children that same reaction and experience is recognizing leading people in the workplace. So how I may talk to Dr. Lowe and how I may need to talk to, uh, uh, you know, John will be completely different. But as a leader, I have to be in tune with understanding what makes my employees feel seen, heard, and valued in the workplace and how do I best motivate them for the next, the next opportunity or for their continued growth and development. Oh, I love that. I love that. You know, there are, five generations in the workplace right now. And so you're right. I do believe that that is uh, a challenge for many leaders. I was working with a, a client last year and I, I'm a Gen, gen Xer. <laughs> and I think most of her leadership team was, was Gen Xers. But here's the thing. We can't think, you know, well, when we were in the workplace, we did this. We just did what we were told or or not, right? We never challenged things. And so um, my conversation with their team was that, you know, you can't think about yourself at <laughs> today <laughs> with this new generation. You have to think, what do they need in order to succeed? What do I need to do to model um, leadership and meet them at their needs because everybody is like ex exiting because they're not, everybody's feeling like they're missing out on something. And so I think if that, if leaders can learn how to uh, manage that, if you will, it, they'll be a lot better off and create intergenerational or multi-generational um, teams. And because everyone brings value. Everyone Every definitely brings value. And I'm, I'm really, um, excited for the emerging generation, um, Gen Z. I think I said Gen Y earlier, but Gen Z. Yeah. Uh, simply because they are throwing the playbook out the window in so many ways. And if we didn't learn anything from the COVID uh, pandemic and social justice movement that we saw in 2020, yeah. it's kind of like, it's, it's sort of like this moment where we have this unique opportunity to think about how we're doing business differently. Mm -hmm. And I think that only comes across every century. Like, you know, you have industrial revolution. So now we're at this place of like, you know, in 2019, if I had told someone, hey, you get to work from home two days a week, they would have hugged me. They would have called us the best workplace ever. But now in 2024, if I say, can you come to the office two days a week? Oh, whoa. You don't whoa, like me. You, you, you don't you, like me. You hate me. Yes. You don't like me. And you don't love me. How dare you ask me to come in here two days a week? And yeah. so you see that. And so with that, I think there's such a paradigm shift, but we have to just 
question ourselves. Yeah. And and I'm always a big proponent of uh, teaching someone how to fish versus giving them a fish. So yeah. example I like to say here is like we have uh, up and coming HR rock stars on our team. And I don't want to be one to put out their flame because maybe it didn't work for me when I started my career. Mm -hmm. But so much has changed since then that I'm like, you know what? Give it a try. Between the pandemic, all kinds of stuff, the rules of engagement have shifted. So maybe something I tried when I started in my career didn't work, but maybe today it does. But I would rather them go through that exercise because there could be some things that have changed or maybe we get to the same outcome. Ah, it still doesn't really work in the way in which we would hope. Yeah. But guess what? They're learning on their own. And I think those you know, opportunities to learn, those opportunities to fail are where the greatest lessons are. Absolutely. So you're not that guy, you know, it didn't work for me. It didn't work. We tried it. Um, you're not shooting down ideas. You're like, you're open. Like, Hey, let's, let's, more, let's try it. I'm more of a let's try. Um, yeah. but, to, but, but also to a point that it makes sense and we're not, you know, um, wasting resources. Mm -hmm. I still want you to try, but if you're like, well, let me give it one more go. And it's going to like, no, 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 let's slow down. <laughs> because that's when the people in the older generations can come in and say, based on what I have seen, what I have seen and experienced, if we get three turns ahead of where we are today, let me tell you what's sitting there. Mm -hmm. But because you're junior, your career, you don't, you can't forecast out that far. You can't say what's at the third traffic light. You only know what's maybe at the one right there, maybe the next one. And so with wisdom and experience, you can kind of provide that guidance. But I don't want to provide that guidance too early that you miss the opportunity to really learn and kind of critically think and assess the situation or the opportunity at hand. Right, right. So John, when you were coming up in your career, I'm sure you you had mentors or people that you looked up to. What would you say were some of the, the lessons that you learned that you may share with your team today? I would say my biggest lesson is closed mouths do not get fed. Um, and so, and that was one that I think when I was, possibly starting to do this, or some people call it manifesting. You need to manifest what you want for yourself, what you want for your life, what you want for your community. Yeah. Uh, the brain is a powerful tool. Your words are powerful. And so uh, I say that to a lot of professionals because you are in the driver, you're in the driver's seat of your career. I think oftentimes we give those keys away. We give those keys to our manager. We give those keys away to the company. We give those keys away to the neighbor, to whoever. But they don't have the same, um, they in no way will have the same investment that you would have in your own professional development. So be cautious of who you're giving those keys to. You control it. Uh, one of the things I like to say is that, you know, stop being long suffering. If you're in an environment that's not allowing you to thrive, that's not allowing you to be your, uh, your whole self, there are other places that are available that will allow you to do that. And I'm a firm believer um, that if you don't, if, if you are unable to, to bring your sort of full self into this space to really maximize the tools that have been uniquely given to you, then the world will go without. And I mean, so do you, do you want yeah. this workplace or this environment or wherever it is to suppress that unique talent that's uniquely you? Or do you want the world to go without? So I say, don't be long suffering. Closed mouths don't get fed. That means you should maximize the opportunities wherever you are and then continue to be strategic in your career and professional development to get you to the next level or where you desire to be. Let me tell you, that's those are all, that's a complete sermon right there. A complete sermon. <laughs> um, I, I love it. I love it. You know, show up as your true self. Closed mouths don't get fed. And for, for those of you who may be saying, you know, oh my God, I've never heard that before. It's use your words, use your voice, ask for what you want, <laughs> ask for what you want. Um, and then long suffering. You know, I, I believe that that is something. I'm so glad you said that because some of the other generations, I think they, they believed in long, they, they inherited long suffering. I'm going to say that they inherited long suffering. And then maybe millennials, Gen Z, Gen X, we saw that and we we're like, mm, I don't want that for my life. <laughs> and so when part of when they show up in the workplace, um, it's like, I don't want that. So I want to show up in this way. And so it, it it throws off the apple cart. You know, <laughs> if you're in a different generation, you're like, wait a minute, I don't know how to deal with that. Um, 
But that long suffering is something because we all have choices and we've got to stop giving the keys away mm -hmm. to our choices. I love that. I love, love, love that. One so, of the things I'll say about the, you know, the different generations, because you said they inherited that maybe the long suffering. I think the speed in which information travels has allowed the younger generations to see things differently. Yes. So, for example, when I was a kid, uh, we had a set of encyclopedias. My daughters would say, why do we have the same book in the house? Like they would probably look like, why did you buy 20 of the same books? Because, you know, yeah. they were a set. Um, but with that, your 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 knowledge was limited to sort of your immediate circle of influence mm -hmm. and so yes you went and got that job at the big company in your hometown and you stay there but now as technology has has exceeded and i'm no longer looking for jobs in the newspaper i'm now going on the world wide web and i'm seeing a plethora of opportunities some that could be remote some that could be this some that could be that there is greater curiosity within the workplace of where you could see yourself today and in the future and so when you think about those generational mix, there is also a shift in how long people are staying at various companies. Absolutely. Um, I'm a firm believer that wherever I am, you know, helping to lead and cultivate talent and, and, and partner with an executive leadership team to drive a business strategy, I want it to be known as the best place to work and a best place to be and a great place to be from. So if we are a great place to work, that means that we have According to your toolkit, we have allowed you to to elevate your career, increase your professional development. But there could come a point where you're ready for the next level, but it's just not available here when you want it. Yeah. But as a good company, I want to be able to say, hey, you know what, Dr. Lowe, I know you're ready for the head of X, Y, Z function. But, you know, our succession plan and we're not there yet, like we have a person there, they're operating. How can I partner with you to find that opportunity, even if that's external? Wow. So now we've become a great place to be from and we were a springboard to your career. And at the end of the day, if you were a good talent with us, we helped you grow and expand your career set, even if that means external to our walls. I think that allows you to now get a different uh, an added level, an added skill set that we could never offer you because we don't have the DNA of said company that you're going to. But guess what? You could always circle, circle back, circle yeah. the block and you could be a boomerang employee. But now you're coming back to us with this additional knowledge that we probably never could have delivered to you. And so those are those are key things that I think are important as we look at cultivating talent. We want you to be here for um, a good time and a productive time, not necessarily, and I don't mean this in a negative way, not, not the stress on it being a long time. Mm -hmm. Putting in time, just racking up years. Correct. Just, just racking up years. You know, you, you said something, we want to be um, that, that great place to work, you know, best in class. What makes a, you know, best place to work workplace? I, I see these um, articles that come out, you know, here's the list of the 100 best places to work. In your opinion, what makes what makes that so? What makes your workplace the best place to work? I think work? it's it's a place where you have relationships um, and you get below the waterline. You know, Dr. Lowe isn't just employee ABC123. Dr. Lowe is a is a is a friend, a daughter, a neighbor, uh, has pets, enjoys this, enjoys that. I get I know you for who you are as a person, not just what you do for the organization. Um, uh, a best workplace is one that has clear communication, which is a challenge for all companies and is one that also has transparent communication. Uh, so that way, everyone kind of understands what we're doing, why we're doing, and the, the appropriate level of, of details needed and necessary so that everyone can be effective. And then again, I would say it's a place that, in, that inspires and partners with you in the driver's seat of your career. So mm -hmm. we don't want to take the keys, but I want to enable you to know that these are your keys and these are different things that we can put in your trunk. These are different things that we can put in your suitcase because we're on this journey traveling on the highway. But these right. are the things that we can offer you. But also, if you get to a place where you're like, you know what, I want to go to this rest stop or, hey, I've hit a dead end road. Where do I go from here? We can also partner with you to help elevate. So there's there's a lot of levers that go into being a, a best workplace. But I think the biggest thing is in a, in a, a workplace that excites you, a mm -hmm. workplace that you don't feel as if you are long suffering. Now, guess what? Workplaces can't be all things to all people. Right. And that's why we have multiple workplaces. So maybe this place doesn't work for you and that's okay, but maybe it does. And that's great. So you got to figure out what that, that balance is and that nuance that specifically speaks to what you're looking to achieve in that space and time. Mm. 
I love that relationships um, go belong, get to know who your people are, get to know them and, and respect. Also, I think um, respect that if someone only wants to show up and do their job, that that's okay too. And it's okay to know that about their person, clear communication, transparency, and, um, and creating a place where people can can grow an incubator, if you will. So um, what are your thoughts on toxic organizations? And, and tell us if you have a process for ensuring that your organization doesn't fall prey to organizational toxicity. Good question. Um, I think there are some tools you can have in place to make sure your organization doesn't fall into that, that bucket. I mean, I think that's just your annual engagement survey. You got to survey your employees so you have a pulse of what's going on throughout the organization. Mm -hmm. There's no way that I, as, as the head of HR, could have that level of awareness. But in doing the survey, um, I'm able to pick up on every pocket of the organization. And if you kind of put those things on a heat map, you're like, mm, something's going on over here. Mm. You know, let's let's try to probe a little bit further. Let's let's. So the biggest thing is like, be curious. Uh, what's going on? Listen to your employees. You know, you, as as, a, as an HR professional, even as a people leader, you learn how to pick up on clues when something's not right. And maybe people are unsure of how to say it or to report it. But start being curious. Start asking more probing questions to understand. And then also, I believe in, I'm going back to being a great place to work and a great place to be from. I, I at times have witnessed those that can be toxic or maybe are no longer having a positive experience in the workplace are those that are ultimately frustrated. And they're frustrated about something that could be tied to, I didn't get that promotion. It could be something that they're frustrated is that I, I've been wanting growth, but I'm not getting it here. So then I go back to the long suffering piece. Mm. Do I stay and become so bent out of shape about, at times, things that I can't control but also trying to push forward in an environment where I have been told that this opportunity is not for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would say to any of those individuals that find themselves maybe in that spot or know someone, know that this is not the only place you can work. <laughs> um, and, and I say that because I'll, I'll use myself as an example. There was, there was a point, point in my career where I was at a place and I was like, ah, um, I'm ready for something else, but it's like, but I got the job, you know, I got steady income, like just roll with it. And my, my wife came to me, she's like, you know, you can get a job somewhere else. And I was like, oh no, but that just seems like a lot of work. I need to get my resume together. I need to apply for jobs. I got an interview. And then finally she was like, okay, like you keep talking about the same thing. It doesn't mean that that's not a, a great place to be. It just means that you are ready for something different, something else. Yeah. Yeah. And so I tell those people that are in those spots, take that first step. Take that first step, bet on yourself. Again, closed mouths don't get fed and let's not be long suffering. So I, I think it, it, at times, and I can say specifically in sports, because people that work in sports, there's a level of passion that comes with it because I've mm -hmm. always wanted to work for the, the you know, NASCAR. I've always wanted to work for the Chicago Bulls. I've always wanted to work for the uh, New England Patriots, whatever the team is. Like, it's such a like, oh, I finally made it. But don't let your excitement about getting to XYZ workplace suppress your desire for professional development in your function area. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another thing I'll say, like, don't stay in sports because it's sports, stay in sports because you like sports, but also you're able to thrive and grow. But there could come a point in time where I like sports, but those upward mobility, up, upward opportunities are either limited or not presenting themselves to me anymore. Then pivot. Yeah. And stay within your function area. You can always circle back, but don't let that become something that starts to impact your well-being, your mental health, um, et cetera. And then, and then there's other, sometimes you just have bad actors. And so yeah. you have oh. <laughs> to figure out how to, to navigate them in, out, or around the, the, the system. Yeah. You know, I, I want to go back to something, you know, you, we've been talking about this long suffering. And I think, you know, long suffering in silence, you know, as an employee, you, which goes back to closed mouths, don't get fed, open your mouth and let your manager, your director, your supervisor know, I, I'm feeling stuck. I don't know what to do. Are there any development opportun opportunities? Ask the question, I didn't get the job. Why didn't I get the job? What do I need to, to do to improve? 
Um, because as long as you're kind of sitting in this place and stewing, you're you're not going to be growing. You're going to be effect affecting the culture of the organization. And ultimately, they may uninvite you to the party, <laughs> i.e. escort you out the door. So um, I, I think the, the reoccurring theme here is use your voice. And I know for some people, John, that's the, it's a, a it's for it's some hard. people, for some cultures, uh, depending on how you grew up, that can be a struggle, right? And so you fall into the that place of long suffering. What what would you say to, I don't know, that first generation person um, who who's working in your organization and it's not, you know, I, I don't understand, you know, using my voice. I just, I mean, what would you tell them as far as growing and and how to maneuver that? I would say always be curious. Um, mm -hmm. And because I'm trying to, to think, where did I learn that? Um, yeah. And I go back to a story. I've always been a talker ever since I was a kid. And my dad is, he's deceased. He passed when I was 13. But he always reminded like my my mom, my older brother, like, y'all leave John alone. That one day his ability to talk is going to be his superpower. Yeah. And while my father is not here, he was able to see that and have that foresight and vision for where I may go professionally or just as an adult. And I'm so glad that he he didn't suppress my voice. And so even with me being a father now of two little girls, I want them to be bossy, mm -hmm. leaders, executives. So I want them to negotiate with me. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's always rules of engagement. But no, tell me what you think. Well, daddy, I don't want to do this. Well, tell me why. And so let's have that conversation because I don't ever want to suppress their voice. And so the same thing I've seen with employees in the workplace there, there's been times where someone has come to me like they had a they they, they weren't having a good engagement with maybe someone they reported to. Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, have you ever told this person? Well, no. Step one is to is to make people have awareness to whatever the behavior is and how it's impacting you. Mm -hmm. And I think in doing that, we would all be so much further along in what we do. Because unfortunately, I'm not a mind reader. You're not a mind reader. But there are times where someone is doing something, maybe that's how they were always treated, taught, raised. And so they don't have an awareness of how that may impact others. So that goes back to the emotional intelligence piece. But I also believe you have you have to find the space, the courage, and the time to say, hey, you said this the other day, and I just have to let you know, that really hurt my feelings, and this is why. Yeah, That's the first step. And then you can let them respond and kind of see where it goes, but that humanizes me as the person on the other end of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm, nine times out of 10, if you bring it to someone like that, they're going to sit with that for a beat and say, whoa, that was not my intention. And if they're really good, they'll say, but I understand how it impacted you. Because yeah. intention and impact are two different things. I can have all great intentions, but if the impact is was X, then I have to sit with that. So I think back to a quote from Maya Angelou where she said, uh, people don't remember what you say, they remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. And that is that is so true. Mm -hmm. So true. You meet some people who you know that fill your cup up and you know and you meet some people that you know drain your cup. And so you have to be aware of who those individuals are, what their roles are, and then how do you best protect yourself there? So set those boundaries. I would also say, look, here's a life hack. Get on TikTok. I know y'all watched the, 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 the 52 part series about the lady who had the bad marriage, but get on there because there's great HR professionals and leaders that are sharing thought leadership on how to set boundaries, how to speak up for yourself, how to advocate for yourself. If you're an introvert, nine times out of 10, that's going to be more so in a one-to-one -one setting. If you're an extrovert, you may talk to peoples in groups, but figure out what is that path that makes you feel most comfortable in delivering that and know that you have to find your comfort spot, comfort spot with being able to speak up for yourself. Yeah, yeah, that is good, good stuff. You know, many times uh, leaders do, and, and you know, I, I say, I quote this quote often. I John Maxwell says that people do what they see. And if you're a leader and if you've not seen 
what uh, healthy leadership is, um, effective leadership is. You're going to show up and you're going to repeat what you've seen, oftentimes not realizing the impact it has on a person. And depending on the environment, if no one says anything, and then that day that someone uh, has the courage to speak up and say what you said was offensive. It hurt my feelings. It didn't sit well with me. And they do it um, in a way that honors themselves. It it will make you stop and think about, you know, why, why did I even say that? Where did this come from? Where did I learn it? And so that you can really, um, really start to engage your team in a different way. You know, I, I, I love the book, you know, Difficult having difficult conversations. I believe a lot of times people shy away from having these conversations. And again, you know, they they suffer in silence, you know, and instead of having the conversation, make it a learning opportunity for both people. And um, I think that just really makes for a stronger organizational culture when mm -hmm. people know, hey, it's okay to talk about the stuff that might not be okay. And that's where the relationship piece comes in. Yeah. Those conversations will feel a lot easier if I have a, just a bit of a greater rapport with Dr. Lowe. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lowe, now you know you my you my friend, but I got to pull your coattail on something. You really mm -hmm. hurt my feelings the other day. Let me just explain it why. I don't believe that that was your intention, but I have to be honest with myself and share with you that was the impact that it had on me. Yeah. And so we can talk through that. Um, even I believe in a good part two meeting. If I'm mm -hmm. having to have a difficult conversation with someone um, I may say, hey, this is a lot for both of us to process right now. So if it's fine with you, I'm not looking for a response right at this moment, but I'd love to circle back in a week mm -hmm. um, because typically we both had time to process and have greater clarity. And then we come back to the conversation with some of that initial emotion removed. And now we're able to talk through it more logically to get to an appropriate outcome. Mm, I love it. A part two, you you don't have to resolve everything in that that one conversation no because <laughs> more than likely i i've had time to sit and think about it and process it and now i'm i'm coming to you and i want you to give me an answer right there that's not yeah no. it's not gonna work even even with performance management processes you know i i believe feedback is a gift let's start there feedback yes. is an invaluable gift and if you never get it i feel like you're being shortchanged so you should be soliciting feedback you should really be asking for it because that's where the growth is and it can be small things, but those small things could really help propel you to that next level. Mm -hmm. So I remember having an employee who was doing great work, but they had they were they were early in their career doing great work. And I was just like, hey, you're you're a rock star. You're, you're nailing it. But then there was a couple of things like, hey, let me bring your awareness to this. But this individual and you know, I would even say it could be a generational complex. Whoa, you didn't you you gave me feedback. You mean I'm not perfect? Oh, you're 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 damn good, but yeah, we we all have room for growth and and Absolutely. and maturity. And they took it to heart. Oh, I just like the conversation. I had even like practiced it. I wanted this to land right, and you know, you can see the tears building up in their eyes. And you know, I and I that was when I first realized the part two. I said, "Hey, I know this is a lot to process right now, mm -hmm. um, and I don't want you to." I don't want a strong review to be overshadowed by 10% of constructive feedback. Yeah. I said, so let's do this. Sit with this, think about it. And next week I'll put time for us to circle back. When we did the circle back, they were like, you know what? Sorry for the overreaction there. What you said makes sense. I appreciate the feedback. I appreciate the examples. And we can, we can definitely build from this. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like, you know, um, feedback definitely is a gift. We all have, none of us come out of the box already assembled. None of us have are perfect and, we, and we're going to mess up. And if someone says, hey, if you tweak this just a little bit, <laughs> or in some cases you may need to tweak it a lot, it is a gift because I can see you walking off and you're going to you're going to walk off into the river. I can either let you do it <laughs> or I can say, hey, come on back. I don't want you to drown. One of my colleagues said, look, we had a great year, but nobody walked on water. Well, there we go. 
well, there we go. <laughs> Does that mean we failed? No, that means we had a phenomenal year. But guess what? None of us walked on water. So like, yeah. let's keep digging. We still have room. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. How can we make it an even better year Correct. next year? Right? Right? So John, I know you are aware of the um, <clears throat> the World of Work report that says um, by 2025, 50% of the workforce will need to be upskilled and reskilled. I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago and I think the report has been updated and it's saying by 2027, 60% of the workforce will need to be upskilled or reskilled. And and you know, before we we started, we were kind of having a conversation offline. What is what's happening in your role or within your organization? Um to help people identify where they need to be upskilled or reskilled. Uh, yeah, so we've done a lot of investment in our learning and development space. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure when we talk about being that great place to work, that we can give you the opportunities and the resources to upskill, reskill yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it may be driven by us. Some of it, it should be driven by you. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're giving you those tools and options to consider as you want to upskill yourself. I also say upthink yourself. So there's so much information that's available to us um, in the workplace. So I'm really excited about generative AI. And there are colleagues and partners who haven't even heard of it. Matter of fact, I was I was talking to a, a peer the other day and they were asking about something. I said, you know what, I would, I would have you tried chat GPT? And they're like, well, what is that? I was like, are you familiar with AI? They're like, mm, not really. Um, and so I said, hey, let's log in. Let's share your screen. Go to chatgpt.com and set up your account. So we did it for, I was like, tell tell it to write you a poem about today's weather. And they were just like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then I said, so now put in the thing that you wanted to discuss with me around this framework. And it spit out something that was like a, a framework, but also just a draft, a, an idea generator, a, something to get you started, a spring. Mm -hmm. And they were like, whoa, this is game changer. I never would have known this existed. And so when I think about the capabilities of the mm -hmm. future uh, technologies and how we will work in the future, I don't believe that the human aspect will be left out. I want to be very clear on that. Yes. But I believe that the human aspect and the human processes can be um, amplified. They can be multiplied by the technology that will enable us. So when you think about AI plus HI equals ROI, and so that's from Sherm. They talk about artificial intelligence is the AI plus HI, which is human intelligence, equals the return on the investment. Like mm -hmm. we're going to be partnered together with this artificial intelligence and this human intelligence. Mm -hmm. I don't see us going to in space where the, the the nuance of us being as human beings will ever be removed because guess what? Everything we do is nuanced and it's hard to program nuance. And yeah. so I think there's just a lot of opportunity there. But yes, we're going to need to continue to upskill ourselves. We need to really, we're really focused on developing a learning culture, not the culture where we are pushing feedback. I mean, pushing learning to you. We want the culture where you are saying, I want the learning. Where is the learning? I want more. So that's a culture shift. But with that, we have to have the right tools and structures and process. So I'm super excited about some of the work we're doing there. We have uh, a dynamic leader on our team, Rob Carmen and, and Chandler Love and Laura Jackson that are really helping us in that space. So I'm excited to see where we're going to go. But we've already relaunched our NASCAR University platform. Uh, mm -hmm. We have new new vendors that we're working with our learning management system to get new talent, to get new resources, also to get different perspectives shared when we're bringing in trainers. We don't need the same profile training us every day. We need different people because when you bring in different people, you're going to get different outcomes and you're going to get new ideas. Yeah. Oh, I'm over here like falling out of my seat. I'm loving everything that you're saying because as a learning development training consulting company, that is um, that's one of the things that that I want to happen when I go into an organization. That this is a, a not a training is it's it's an event. It's a one time one size fits all thing. But it is continuous and you take ownership of it and not just depend on the organization to say, well, you need this. But if you're really 
open to feedback and you're learning some things and you have a growth mindset, you're going to create that, that um, lifelong learner for yourself. And you, and you can't even allow yourself to become so comfortable. So when something like AI comes up or um, I know in Chipotle, Chipotle in California, they're going to be replacing their, their cooks with robots. You're not worried about stuff like that. You're not worried about it because you have been on a, a growth trajectory that it's like, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready for whatever comes comes my way. So I, I love this. AI plus HI equals ROI. I love it. I love it. We've talked about a lot and there's probably so much more that we could talk about. What would you, uh, a, a leader listening to our conversation today, what would you want him or her to take away from this conversation? Mm, what would I want them to take away? Um, and apply. Uh, <laughs> yes, I have, I have, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a phrase that's coming to my head and I don't think I have the little post-it anymore. Um, I would say the biggest thing is recognize the impact and influence that you have in your interactions with people. Uh, someone said, I saw this online the other day, they said, sometimes your managers can have greater influence on your mental health than your spouse or your partner or your family. So recognize and understand the responsibility that you have and ensure that your team members feel safe, heard, and valued in your presence. Yes. I love it. I love it. John, what are you reading that we should be reading? So I'm reading two books and I'm going to focus on one right now. And it is Lead to Win by Carla Harris. Okay. If you are not familiar with Carla Harris, you are missing out. Uh, she is my internet auntie. Um, I've had a chance to meet her. She is an executive uh, with Morgan Stanley. Uh, she is just full of knowledge, authenticity, uh, but just a person that you will want to learn more from. Uh, her book talks about various strategies in the workplace. And if you don't have time to read the book, just look her up on YouTube. She has tons of content out there that, that gives you clear and concise uh, ways in which you can influence uh, you know, your work environment, but also continue to upskill yourself, advocate for yourself. Uh, so Lead to Win by Carla Harris uh, is, is one of my go-tos. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Thank you for sharing that. I'll be adding that to my reading list. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We've been chatting with John Ferguson, Chief Human Resources Officer for NASCAR. Visit the show notes to see how to connect with John. Be sure to grab a copy of Results Driven Organizations, The Four Keys to a High Performance Workplace. You can use the link in the show notes and grab our special gift to you for being a valuable listener. Until next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Results Driven Organizations podcast with Dr. Tanya Lowe. Be sure to review the show notes for the resources mentioned and don't forget to grab your free gift available at freegiftfromtanya.com. Until next time.